Railroads can play a critical role for any nation during a war. During the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865, the heavy use of railroads by the Union Army played a key role in their victory over the Confederate Army in terms of transport for munitions, troops, the wounded, and more. During World War I, this was no different for the European countries, including Great Britain. New branch lines, sidings, and munition factories were all being set up for the impending Great War throughout the 1910s. At Richburg, Kent, the new port there included the world's first roll-on, roll-off rail ferry service. By the second week of the First World War, 14,008 extra trains were running on British railroads with some arriving at ports every 12 minutes, ranging from troop trains taking soldiers to board ships headed to the front lines in France, to hospital trains stretching one-third of a mile long filled with nurses and wounded soldiers, and even the weekly Jellicoe specials, named after Admiral of the Fleet John Jellicoe, which carried coal from southern Wales to the Royal Navy Fleet in the Orkney Islands. However, during the entire course of the war, this endless flow of trains full of soldiers, horses, equipment, munitions, coal, and other things would not go without incident. And unfortunately, one year into the war, in 1915, there would be an incident that would go down as the worst train wreck in British history. May 22, 1915, 6 a.m. in the morning, Quintons Hill, Dumfrieshire. In this historic part of Scotland in the fields lay the Quintons Hill signal box, which was a remote location sited to control two passing loops, one on each side of the double track main line of the Caledonian Railway. Alexander Thorburn, the station master at Gretna Station, was responsible for the operation of the signal box to make sure trains ran smoothly. The box was staffed by one signalman on a shift system with one morning shift and one night shift, with the night shift changing with the morning one at 6 a.m. On this day of the disaster, George Meekin was the night signalman, while James Tinsley was to work the early day shift. At this time of day, normal northbound traffic through the area included two overnight express trains from London to Glasgow and Edinburgh respectively, which were due to depart Carlisle at 5.50 a.m. and 6.05 a.m. They were to be followed by a local train from Carlisle to Bedock, which was due to depart Carlisle at 6.10 a.m., but which normally departed at 6.17 a.m. If the overnight express trains ran late, the local service could not be held back to depart from Carlisle after them because precedence would then need to be given to the scheduled departure of rival company express trains at 6.30 a.m. and 6.35 a.m. from other railroads. Also, any late running of the local train would cause knock-on delays to the Moffat and Glasgow and Edinburgh commuter train service that the local connected with at Bedock. Therefore, in the event of one or both of the overnight trains running late, the local would be departing at its normal scheduled time of 6.10 a.m. and then would be shunted into one of the intermediate stations or signal boxes to allow the express trains to pass. One of the locations where this could take place was Quintons Hill, where there were passing loops for both the up and down lines. If the northbound loop, the down line, was occupied, then the northbound train would be shunted via a trailing crossover to the up southbound main line. This method of operation, while quite risky, was allowed by the rules and was not considered to be a dangerous maneuver, provided the proper precautions are taken. In the six months before the accident, the 6.17 a.m. local had been shunted at Quintons Hill 21 times. For those occasions, it was on the up main line. On May 22nd, the two express trains were running late, so the local, led by car D in class 460 number 907, would have to be shunted into a siding to allow the express trains to pass. In this case, it was Quintons Hill. But there was a problem. 
northbound freight train was occupying the loop for the northbound track, and to make matters worse, an empty Jellico special coal train going back to Wales was due in a few minutes with a troop train led by 139 class 440 number 121 carrying the 7th battalion of the Royal Scots was coming right behind the coal train. So the night shift signalman had to think of something and fast. He made the local stop on the northbound main track and instructed the local to clear the next set of points ahead, stop, then back up on the southbound main track to wait. He would then signal the coal train to use the empty southbound loop to wait for the southbound troop train, since express trains and troop trains always took the highest priority. The local train complied and backed onto the southbound main and stopped at 6.33 a.m with the coal train pulling into the southbound loop four minutes later. This was the moment the first seeds of disaster were planted. The first northbound express passed by without incident. This, however, invited a nice convenience for the morning signalman, as he could get off the now-parked local train he was traveling on and walk straight up to the signal box at Quintons Hill to take the night shift signalman's place. The two would later have a little chatter and read the morning newspaper that the morning signalman had brought with him before the night shift signalman would head off. Both guards from the freight trains had also entered the signal box, and there was some discussion of the war reported in the newspapers. Shortly after that, because of the local train had stood on the main line for over three minutes, as required by Rule 55 of British Rail Regulations, the driver of the local sent Fireman George Hutchinson to the signal box, as Rule 55 states that if a train was brought to a stand at a signal within three minutes, in clear weather, or immediately in rain, snow, or fog, the driver of the train must send his fireman, guard, or any shunter riding on the train to the signal box to ensure that the signalman was aware of the presence of the train and that all safeguards to protect it, such as slides or collars on the signal levers, were in place, as this was before modern train dispatching elements were introduced. The crewman would then sign the train register to confirm this and report back to his train. Although he left at 6.46 a.m., he failed to fully perform the required duties. After the first northbound express flew by, the station master offered the southbound troop train to Quintons Hill to pass through. Signalman Tinsley immediately agreed, and four minutes later, he was offered and accepted the second northbound express from Gretna Junction, being led by two locomotives number 140 of the Dunal Stair 4 class and number 48 of the 43 class, both being 440s. At 6.47 a.m., Tinsley received the train entering section signal from Kirkpatrick for the troop train and asked to have the troop train proceed forward to Gretna Junction. The troop special was immediately accepted by Gretna Junction, so Tinsley pulled off his up home signal to allow the troop train to pass. However, the men had totally forgotten about the local train that was still sitting on the main line. The troop train was headed down the main line at nearly 129 kilometers an hour, or 80 miles an hour, and at 6.49 a.m. <laughs> troop train collided head-on with the stationary local on the up line. 30 seconds later, the second northbound express, trying to stop and avoid the derailed trains, tripped over the wreckage and derailed at over 80 kilometers an hour, or 50 miles an hour. The sound of crunching wood, screeching steel, and the screams of victims filled the air. The derailing passenger trains also sent wreckage toward the stopped freight trains, causing the cars from them to also derail. The wooden coaches telescoped into one another from the impact, and the gas-powered interior lights ruptured their gas tanks, setting the coaches on fire, spreading the flames even through the undamaged upright coaches. 
Some of the passengers that escaped the wreckage from the local and troop trains were also mowed down by the Northbound Express as it crashed into the wreckage. Local farmers that heard the crash and survivors quickly tried to help those still trapped in the burning wreckage, with some victims requiring amputation of limbs to free them. Rumor has it that some soldiers even shot those that were burning alive to put them out of their terrible misery. A total of approximately 226 people died, and 246 were injured, most of them seriously. The overwhelming majority of fatalities were among the men in the Royal Scots, and the precise number was not established as the roll list of the regiment was destroyed in the fire. Of the 500 soldiers of the 7th Battalion of the Royal Scots on the troop train, only 58 men were present for roll call at 4 p.m. that afternoon, along with 7 officers. Amazingly, despite the double collision and fire, there were only a few casualties in the other two trains. On the local train, only two passengers died, 28-year-old Rachel Nimmo and her 1-year-old son Dixon. None of the survivors on the local were injured. On the express train, only seven passengers died, with a further 51 passengers and three crew members injured. Some of the bodies were never recovered, having been incinerated by the fire. And when the bodies of the men of the Royal Scots were returned to Leith on the 24th of May, they were buried together in a mass grave in Edinburgh's Rosebank Cemetery. Of the soldiers killed, 83 bodies were identified, 82 were recovered but unrecognizable, and 50 were missing altogether, probably incinerated in the wreckage. The soldiers were buried with full military honors. Among the coffins were four bodies which were unidentified and appeared to be the remains of children. One coffin was simply labeled as Little Girl, unrecognizable, and the other three as three trunks, possibly children. As no children were reported missing, the railway company, the Caledonian Railway, moved the bodies to Glasgow for possible identification, but no one came forward to claim the identity of the bodies. Some think they may have been soldier bodies badly shriveled and reduced by the burning. The four were buried in Glasgow's western necropolis on the 26th of May. The engine crew of the troop train, who were also killed, were both from Carley and were also buried on May 26 by Stanwick Cemetery. As for the surviving soldiers, they were sent to Carley on the evening of the crash and sent back to Liverpool the next morning on another train. On arrival, they were medically examined and all the enlisted men and one officer were declared unfit for service overseas and were returned to Edinburgh. Lieutenant Colonel W. Carmichael Peebles and five other officers were fit enough to sail from Liverpool for overseas service in France. It was reported in the Edinburgh Weekly that on their way from the port to the railway station, the survivors were mistaken for prisoners of war and pelted with rocks by some local children, as if they didn't have enough pain to deal with. The investigation revealed several glaring breaches in railroad regulations. For the 6 a.m. shift change, the signalman had developed an informal arrangement allowing whoever was working the early day shift to arrive for work almost a half hour late. This allowed the day shift signalman to get up slightly later, and in the case of Signalman Tinsley, who lived in Gretna, it enabled him to travel to work on the local train on days when it was to be shunted at Quintons Hill. The signalman at Gretna Junction would let Tinsley know if this was to occur or not. To avoid this malpractice being detected by the company management, whichever signalman was working the night shift we record all train register entries after 6 a.m. on a piece of paper rather than in the register book itself. When the day shift man arrived, he would copy the entries from the paper into the train register in his own handwriting making it appear that the shift change had occurred at the correct time. The changing of shifts was a safety critical moment where it was essential that the signalman taking over the box was fully aware of the position of trains and for all block signaling requirements to be properly completed and recorded. 
The need for Signalman Tinsley to copy out the missing train register entries as soon as he took over the signal box may have distracted him from his duties in relation to the handover of the box. Also, two crucial failures in block signaling procedure occurred. First, as soon as the train out of section bell code had been telegraphed to the Kirkpatrick signalman to advise that the empty coal train was out of the block and clear of the up main line at Quintons Hill, the Quintons Hill signalman should have followed up by sending the blocking back bell code to Kirkpatrick. This would advise the Kirkpatrick signalman that another train, the down local, was occupying the up main line inside the Quintons Hill home signal. On receipt of the blocking back bell, the Kirkpatrick signalman would not have been allowed to offer another up train, in this case the troop train, to Quintons Hill until he had received the obstruction removed bell from the Quintons Hill signalman to confirm that the local was clear of the up line and out of the way. However, although the train out of section signal was belled to Kirkpatrick, the blocking back signal was never sent. Secondly, Tinsley should have placed a signal lever collar over the relevant signal lever, which would have reminded him not to clear his signals for the upline because of the local train occupying it. Other factors included the failure of Rule 55, where the local train fireman merely signed the train register using a pen which Tinsley, who was on the intent of filling the missing entries of the train register, handed over his shoulder without looking up and returning to his engine, without reminding the signaler of his train's position or checking that the signalman had placed a lever collar on the signal lever. Also, the guards of the other trains being in the signal box weren't supposed to be there. And the mere fact that the signalman just totally forgot about the local sitting on the main track that the troop train was signaled through on was a recipe for a disaster. In the end, the two signalmen and the firemen of the local were charged with culpable homicide. The fireman was found not guilty, but the two signalmen served only a year of jail time, being released in December of 1916, and were unbelievably rehired by the Caledonian Railway as if nothing had happened. But they weren't rehired as signalmen, as Tinsley went to be a lamp man, and Meekin became a goods train guard. Some years later he was made redundant from that job, and set himself up as a coal merchant trading from Quintons Hill Siding right next to the scene of the crash site. In the Second World War, he worked in the Gretna Munitions Factory until he retired due to ill health. Tinsley died in 1967, and Meekin died in 1953. The locomotives of the troop train, as well as the local, were damaged beyond repair and scrapped, while the locomotives of the express train were returned to service after repairs. Both locomotives would continue their service with the London, Midland, and Scottish Railway, and later British Rail, but unfortunately, by 1958, both locomotives were withdrawn and scrapped. However, many years later, in 2015, a BBC TV documentary called Britain's Deadliest Rail Disaster, Quintons Hill, was first aired on the 20th of May, 2015. The video was a re-examination of the disaster in a modern-day rail inquiry. It argued that both the signalmen had been made scapegoats for the crash and there may have been some conspiracy to cover up the fact that the Caledonian Railway and the government, who ran the railway during the war, were actually responsible instead. They even said that the railway's attitude toward their own rules was rather tardy, stating that they barely even followed their own rules, mainly letting issues like the late arrival of signalmen for shift changes slide under the watchful eyes of managers. They even pointed out the Caledonian Railway's desire to keep peacetime service running to make more money, even though the network was experiencing tons of extra wartime traffic, and they didn't realize that this could put added stress on the signalman. It also argued that the local train would not have sat on the main line in the first place if the passing loops had not been used as storage sidings to store the two freight trains. It finally also sought to take some blame away from Tinsley because he may have been suffering a form of epilepsy, which affected his short-term memory, which they argued would have explained why he may have simply forgot of the waiting local train. Whether you blame the Caledonian Railway or the Signalman, we can all agree 
that this terrible tragedy during the First World War was just as tragic as the war itself.